Hello, everyone. My name is Kyle Matthews. I'm the executive director of the Montreal Institute for Genocide and Human Rights Studies. We're very pleased today to continue a set of interviews as part of the AI and COVID-19 Disinformation Initiative, uh, a project supported by the OSCE's representative on freedom of the media uh, to discuss, um, yeah, the intersection of AI, COVID-19 disinformation, and what the implications are for freedom of expression. So today, we're very lucky to have another uh, expert with us working on many of these issues. We have Fabio uh, Cusi. Uh, Fabio, um, you're uh, you're associated with uh, Algorithm Watch, an important, uh, in, important um, non-governmental organization looking at technology algorithms and a whole set of public policy issues. You're currently the project leader for the Automating Society uh, project. Uh, uh, Fabio, thank you for joining us today. And thank you for having me. Thanks so much. So, Fabio, maybe to start off, tell me about uh, what does your work focus on? What do you do at Algorithm Watch? Yeah, well, uh, at Algorithm Watch, we actually watch algorithms, as the, the name says, and we basically do more than that, actually. Uh, we try to understand what automated decision making systems are, which is, which is something larger than technology per se. It's some, we call them social technical systems. So, we try to understand the way in which these technologies try and interact and interplay with politics and, and you know, and, and relations of power and justice and, of course, human rights and, and freedom of expression, too. Uh, and so we try to understand how these systems work in, in different settings. So we have different projects for that. And the one that I've been working on for the last uh, over more than a year, uh, it's called Automating Society. And it, it, it resulted in a, in, a, in a report that we published in October. And now we're presenting in different languages, in French and Spanish and Italian. And, and it basically tries to understand how these systems interact with public policy uh, and, and also with other uh, interesting policies and, and choices that matter for the lives of everybody, really, in 16 countries in, in Europe uh, and at the EU level, so the European uh, Union level. And so we try to do this with, with a, a network of around 40 persons, <laughs> researchers, you know, even comics artists we had to actually illustrate cases because we, we do think that these things matter for everybody. Uh, and so uh, we try with these different uh, levels of, of, let's say, storytelling, try and understand uh, what's going on uh, in Europe because we don't really know. And what we found is basically that a lot is going on under, in disguise, let's say, because it's uh, it's really opaque what's going on. And, and so the, the very first thing that is important to say is that we would need to, to know a lot, still need to, to know a lot more on that. And now we're basically from, Next year, we're going to focus a lot uh, more on uh, exactly on the COVID-19 implications of, of, of all this. And we did so in during the summer with a report that came out in the August uh, that started illustrating how it, automation and this system work into the pandemic. So not specifically on this information, but rather on, on how these systems, for example, you know, uh, working in the context of exposure notification, contact tracing, and, and now with the immunity passports possibly, with vaccinations, algorithms, uh, and things like that. So we we would try and have a look at, at all these things together, uh, which is of course not easy, uh, but we will we would try to do so. So that's that's fascinating. You're you're exactly the right person I should be speaking to. Uh, I'm 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 wondering, um, um, Fabio, if 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 you've seen anything in your recent work, uh, like anything about the key challenges raised by digital disinformation during the COVID pandemic. I know you're getting your work, but are, are you seeing anything in the European context that's going viral online or just is is totally informed? I'm um, wondering if you could comment on that in general. Yeah, we've seen a lot. Of, I, I Myself, I'm, I'm still a journalist too. Uh, I do work for a collective blog called Valiza Blue also in Italy, and we do work a lot on this information. It's actually how this whole thing started. Uh, but the thing is that, you know, this, this this information often comes from the top, very often comes from the top. And that is not only true uh, in general. And, and I remember of a Cornell University study saying that 38 percent or something of misinformation uh, discussions uh, are driven by were driven by former President Donald Trump. So basically uh, a single person, actually, not not even a, 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 a human, like human collective, but just a single person is responsible way more of way more disinformation than any kind of you know uh, bot or, or or rogue organization let's say can do uh, but still uh, of course the problem the problems interplay uh, so of course if you have like uh, a very bad uh, 
traditional media environment, for example, uh, which comprises, of course, of, of what's going on on social media, but also on traditional media, newspapers, print media, uh, TV. Um, and you have a lot of bad information coming up uh, from these from these outlets. Uh, then it becomes even more difficult because in many many cases, many of the cases that I'm tracking myself uh, have to do with uh, cases of disinformation that have been pushed by traditional media on social media. And then the problem compound because, of course, uh, what what is Facebook supposed to be doing with that kind of content? You know, is it supposed to to take it down? And that would be called censorship because this is, you know, mainstream, traditional, and, and established media uh, that would rightly, I think, claim, you know, you've been censoring me, you're, you're censoring my pl pluralism and democracy. Uh, but then again, this has nothing to do with pluralism and democracy in the first place. This has only to get to do with scandalism and money making, you know, from clickbait. And and again. Uh, here we are in, in a very uh, short circuit situation in which Facebook needs to address this. And we ask of Facebook to address this maybe with, you know, labeling, uh, which is they, what they do, or maybe taking down some content even, uh, basically elevating private social networks to, the, to, to policing, uh, to police of speech, or so speech police, as uh, David Kay, the former, you know, uh, representative for freedom of expression in the UN said, you know, that his book is fantastic. Uh, and, and actually, that's what he says. You know, we should be careful, of course, of having these private entities policing speech. But of course, we shouldn't forget the, the way and the reason that they're led to do so is not because they have because they want to have this role. It's because they need to have one in the absence of regulation on one side and on uh, professionalism on the other. You know, uh, so it would only take uh, being professional from uh, professional journalists not to, for example, amplify. Um, and this information uh, uh, for, um, regarding the vaccine, for example, coming from negationists, uh, chefs, for example, which is what happened in, in Italy. And when you actually ask those journalists to, to take responsibility for that, they exactly behave like, uh, like trolls or like bots. They don't take responsibility for that. They just keep it up. You know, and don't give any context to, to people. They don't explain, and they may maybe even you know uh, quote in when they share that content on social media to be quotes. Then you they know they must be picked up by people, and they know that in such a way they they then uh, um, exploit the amplification that algorithm algorithms and of course artificial intelligence provides to them. So of course AI plays a role there. Uh, in amplifying the content, but the problem is that that kind of content is not created by AI most of the time. Uh, it's created by human beings, uh, and that should be avoidable and should be avoided, I think, especially right now in a pandemic, which, you know, this can make, can make a difference between life and death of people. So, uh, Fabio, it's very interesting. You talked about, um, you know, about, um, yes, it's it's politicians, journalists that are that are pushing some of this, and then it's shared online, you you talked about um, some of the remedies to that, such as kind of fact checking or, or, or labeling um, um, stuff that, that we saw around Donald Trump's tweets and then before he was kicked off of, of social media platforms. Um, I'm wondering, um, so that there's an idea of regulation uh, there, but I'm wondering, are there, are there other things that national governments should be doing uh, with regards to social media platforms, particularly how they're algorithms work should we should we be putting a more robust regulation um we're seeing stuff related to online hate that's being passed in germany the eu has a digital charter um is there a, is there a, a, a like a set of best practices that governments should be um enacting to con to to manage these social media platforms yeah absolutely uh, we think so uh, I, I would first uh, like to say though that the ai here is not uh, is neither the problem nor the solution to me and, and and I can and I can and I think I can speak about uh, for the whole organization here when I say this and in, and also when we and when you ask uh, is then does it mean that we, there is nothing to do no of course we need to do something we need regulation uh, the problem is what kind of regulation and we had a project that you know we had last year for example at Algorithm was called uh, governing platforms that was doing exactly that was trying to understand how to better intervene on, on this platform regulation issue, which is very complicated. And of course, as you know, is going on with the DSA, DMA, and all the rest of the Europe, at the EU level at, at least, you know, which is a really advanced discussion there, has been going on for, for quite a while. And one of the first things we, we, we concluded, uh, uh, and my colleagues concluded uh, after you know, a lot of consultation, 
with other experts and other people is that we need more transparency, for example, around data access. We need to know more uh, about what's going on on those platforms. We cannot uh, blindly rely on what these platforms tell us um, because we don't have a way to any way to uh, actually ascertain that what they're saying is true or meaningful. Uh, when they when they speak about absolute numbers or they give percentages, for example, you know what they mean. Uh, we need to be able to compare, and, and we need to create possibly create institutions and, and third parties that that are actually made exactly for that kind of reason to independently certify. And that is, you know, something that is uh, this uh, let's say methodological transparency and and trying to have other people uh, that is uh, other institutions that are actually independent in judging is something that you can see in all algorithmic uh, related issues. Uh, that's the, basically the same kind of issues that we had in, in the report that I curated and, and worked on in, in, a, in public policy and other spheres. Um, we cannot accept uh, what, what people, what producers and vendors of these systems uh, say uh, blanket, blankly, like, like this, you know, with, at face value, let's say. Uh, we should have processes and, and, and schemes and actually rules in place that mandate some kind of procedures and 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 and, and solutions to this. And of course, this is not easy. Uh, and, and of course, this involves, for example, uh, understanding what uh, algorithmic uh, impact assessment really means um, in both the context of information. So, for example, for newsfeed, and in the context of an algorithm that's you know that's deployed by the police to actually predict whether uh, there is more criminality from some. In, in a certain area of a city, you know, we shouldn't. This is really, really crucial because it's really important. We don't. We not only live in an infodemic, you know. We only. We also live in an in, a, in an automated society, uh, of which we don't know basically anything uh, except for the fact that we know that they're automating increasingly. They're pushing face recognition everywhere. They're pushing sound recognition. You know, they're pushing uh, emotion recognition. They're pushing all these kind of stuff. It sounds really scary, actually. Um, and, and it can be possibly, they, in some cases, some technologies can be beneficial, but uh, in this case, for example, we call for user, for example, users that amount to mass surveillance of face recognition and other biometric technologies should be banned, in our opinion, altogether, you know, because uh, there is no real way until or, or until there is a way to reconcile them with human rights. Uh, but, but by what do we know and what we are actually increasingly finding, this is not, not possible just at the, at the moment. So that's fascinating. Just just yesterday in Canada, our privacy commissioner found that an American company, Clearview AI, was engaged in widespread surveillance exactly. of Canadians, and it, and it made international news, and, and we're waking up and realizing, what does that mean for human rights, freedom of expression, uh, freedom of opinion, um, uh, privacy? Uh, there, there, it's, it's societies all around the world, Europe, North America, are dealing with this. Um, I'm wondering, um, when you talk about um, trying to understand this transparency from large tech platforms, um, which is slightly different than, than you know, the surveillance and facial recognition cameras, AI powered facial recognition cameras. But, but does that also include, do you, would you suggest that we need to have public audits of algorithms to understand how they work and, and what they're impacting? Is that part of the impact assessment to the algorithm impact assessment you're talking about? Well, I, I do think so. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, everything that uh, that needs to be done to unpack the the black box uh, and to open it, uh, absolutely. Whatever whatever it takes, uh, of course, uh, to understand to to to, uh, to be able to actually look into those algorithms. And you know, this is very this has been very controversial, as you know. With uh, digital platforms try try many ways and, and schemes. You know, trying to involve researchers and. Um, but at the same time, you know, those schemes were a little uh, weird in the way in which they were deployed. Uh, they were not exactly clear and consistent in the way in which the, even those ac organizations were actually given access to, to the data and everything. And, and so it's, it's kind of controversial, let's say, if we don't have rules, we, do, we cannot, uh, we cannot leave, uh, leave the platforms themselves to, to self-regulate on this, you know. Uh, Maybe self-regulation is good for other things. Uh, I personally think, for example, that we shouldn't be regulating the content uh, or, or what kind of content should stay up in a platform or should not. Because, of course, in, it only takes a couple of passages to, 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 to go into, you know, truth and falsehood, you know, and you don't really... You don't really want to have clear rules mandated from the state about what's true and what should be allowed, you know. It's, 
it's controversial and, and again it, it, it really risk infringing on, on, on human rights again on the other side let's say uh, but at the, at the same time you don't want the platforms to actually be able to say okay we decided that you know we you shouldn't be allowed to have any kind of scraping tool for example for to actually try and understand what's going on on our news feeds and i have many colleagues and friends that try to do so and they have they have problems because for example one day uh, facebook can wake up and say okay this scraping software is illegal and they shut it down and even if it was used for research purposes because they don't they don't really like people actually looking in what into what happens into their algorithms they 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 want to be driving the conversation and you know that's not acceptable we should be driving the conversation there and we should be mandating some rules in, according to which you know they should be transparent and when they are then we should leave them be you know uh you you, you follow the rules you, you, you can operate and not just you know being all, all the time moralistic about oh they didn't do enough well what's enough you know we should be defining what's enough first and then we can say whether they did enough or not that's my opinion at least so fabio perhaps my last question is are you seeing or or is your organization concerned about um we, we talked about algorithms on social media and 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 how sometimes they can enable the spread of misinformation if it's coming from a politician we saw with Donald Trump, but are you seeing any new use of AI, like deepfake technology, or 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 changing? Uh, you know, there's Liarbird that can change people's voices. How mm. much of this coming down the pipeline um, are you looking at, and should we be thinking about as well in the disinformation space? Is this um, something that that is overhyped? Um, it's not that dangerous, or is it something that's really going to alter how we perceive reality and, and are able to see what's true or not? I think we still don't know. Uh, it's a great question. And I, I've been trying to understand that for, for some years now. I even teach that a class at San Marino University about that, uh, the roles that the AI play in information society. And they've been, um, they've been growing fast. They've been um, getting much, much, much and much better faster. And now we've seen you know, a lot of uh, popularized applications like FaceApps, uh, FaceApp and others, you know, that they really, uh, lets you understand how powerful these systems are and how easy it is for them to fool us. I remember, you know, when the first Obama uh, deepfakes and Putin deepfakes, they were clearly wrong, you know? <laughs> and now we, there is a one with a baby Renzi, uh, our former prime minister, which is done with this face up, popular app. This now is not a, a particularly well-trained, you know, system, deep, deep learning system. And yet it's pretty convincing. Uh, it, it really like, looks like a baby. Um, of course, we, we know that it's not, uh, but I can easily imagine ways in which you can be deceived and fooled. And, you know, of course, this is wrong in the first place because of how it started. It started in the pornography industry, of course, and as you all know. Uh, but now it, it can have application of that sort, and especially in, a, in an environment in which we all the time uh, get faster and faster information in bits, you know, in segments, and we don't ever know where exactly it comes from. Uh, it might it might become dangerous. So I think it makes sense to try and and understand what we can do there too, and and you know deep fakes uh, deep fakes literacy let's say would also be a good course <laughs> to have at universities uh, more one day, let's say. Well, I'd like to thank you, Fabio, for joining us today, taking time of your busy schedule to share uh, the important work you're doing at Algorithm Watch um, and giving us an insight about what's happening in the wider European context. Uh, it's very important for us to understand that. Um, so thank you and, um, and we wish you best of luck in your work. Thanks so much, thanks for having me.